Hi, I am Tamara Durham, Vice Provost for Student Affairs here at the University of Kansas, and I am pleased to have joining with me today Dr. Katie Treadwell, who serves as our Director of Student Conduct and Community Standards. Welcome, Katie. Thank you. Good to be here. So we are doing our um, Student Affairs shares uh, focused on um, sharing information with parents and hopefully providing services that are, or sorry, information about um, services so they can support their student. And so today we want you to, of course, talk about the services that um, your office um, provides. So why don't you just give us an overview of what in fact is student conduct and community services or community, sure. yeah, student conduct, community services? Absolutely. Uh, so our office ha has a number of different facets and components, and I think is perhaps one of the most misunderstood campus, misunderstood offices on campus. Uh, I understand that that students and parents, uh, family members can be very scared or nervous or frustrated when they get a nice letter from my office indicating that perhaps something has not gone according to plan uh, and that we need to have a conversation about that. But Part of what my team works really hard to do is to connect with students and connect with families to let them know that we know that conflict happens and mistakes are just a part of the college experience. I certainly had my fair share of learning moments and mistakes when I was in college and uh, roommate conflicts and things like that. And so that's what our office does is work with students to help them know that those situations are not the end of the world that conflict is normal, that mistakes happen, college is a learning experience. And our goal is to work with students and whoever their support system is, family members, friends, loved ones, to navigate those experiences and learn from them and hopefully use those lessons to improve the situation, tackle that uh, experience differently the next time. So there is a formal student conduct component and we can talk about what that looks like if uh, someone's student gets a, a letter about a conduct uh, violation, but we also do a lot of conflict resolution and uh, support troubleshooting for students who are experiencing just difficult circumstances as part of their KU experience. Before you talk about um, helping students manage uh, conflict and uh, coming to some sort of resolution as they're working with roommates or um, within their student orgs, whatever the situation may be. I think parents might be interested to know a little bit about the code, the shorthand, we call it the code, but yes. you want to talk just a little bit about that? Absolutely. So everything that our office does is uh, governed by the code of student rights and responsibilities. And so in some ways, our office is here to help students navigate those responsibilities that they have as KU students, but we are just as equally here to support their rights through the process and to help them understand the rights that they have, not just with uh, the conduct experience, but being a KU student more specifically and, or more generally. So the Code of Student Rights and Responsibilities, exactly what it sounds like, it is KU's version of a um, student code or an honor code to some extent and it outlines all of the rights that they have as KU students. That includes uh, the right to free speech on campus and the right to assemble and uh, advocate for things that are uh, important to them. It also articulates then those responsibilities that they have to be a part of our community that is contributing, contributing to the experience and uh, looking out for and protecting other KU students. And so the Code of Student Rights and Responsibilities is owned by KU Student Senate. I serve as the advisor to the Student Rights Committee. And that code is revised every two years. And so every two years at a minimum, our students are having conversations about what rights and responsibilities they want to protect for themselves and advocate for their peers. And so uh, this year is actually a code revision year. And so we are, are working through that process this year, but really looking at how do we balance, what does it mean to be a successful and healthy community and the students' opportunities to contribute to that. So the student conduct piece um, certainly comes through the code. Any of those student conduct violations that we may talk about 
would originate from the Code of Student Rights and Responsibilities. And one of the things I think that's really unique about KU is that I, in my office, you, don't have the power to edit the code because that is a student-driven document. And so our students are really active members in, in taking ownership for that and defining for each other what the KU experience should be. Great, thank you for that history. So in your earlier uh, comments, you talked about uh, conflict resolution um, with students. Will you talk a little bit more about that process and how you engage with students in that? Sure. So uh, again, we know that conflict is just a part of life. And uh, when you have this many people, students, faculty, staff in one location, conflict is bound to occur. And we want students and families to know that that's a normal experience to, to encounter conflict with another person, whether that's their roommate or a disagreement with someone else they may be living with. Uh, I had my share of, of conflicts and, and concerns that we worked through in group projects and classes when I was an undergraduate student, and that's a normal part of life. Uh, part of what my office does is the conduct violation piece, but we know that the vast majority of conflicts that happen at KU and among our community, we don't necessarily find out about or hear about perhaps until they've escalated to the point that are really unmanageable for students or for families. And what we want people to know is that we have resources to help them navigate those conflicts and, and work through those experiences earlier in the process to hopefully prevent something from really bubbling up and escalating to the point that it's causing major stress or that potential conduct violation. Uh, so when we are working with students uh, our first goal is that we are teaching students how to resolve conflict on their own. And we know that for many of our students uh, at 18 or 19 year old, years old, they may not have had a lot of experience with that in the past. So uh, we would always work with students to learn more about the situation that's happening, hopefully encourage them to try resolving that conflict on their own, work with their roommate, work with their student organization, whatever the situation may be, and give them some tools to engage in that conflict resolution. But we also have services to help them do that in a more intentional way. So my team offers conflict coaching, where we would sit down with an individual student, learn more about the conflict that they are experiencing, and help them strategize some tools and resources to try to go back to that conflict and navigate that on their own. We're not resolving the conflict for them, but we are helping them think through different strategies that they could use in that particular conflict. We also, if things were to escalate, if the conflict coaching didn't work, if the students tried it on their own and uh, is not succeeding in resolving that conflict, we then have the ability to sit down with all of the parties involved. And we have a variety of ways that that could play out, but sit down with all the parties involved and engage in a conversation about what's happening, the concerns, the different perspectives, and then work towards a potential resolution there. And so really depends on what the student wants from that situation, what the facts of that uh, particular experience are, but a lot of resources that, Again, our hope is to give students tools to navigate uh, on their own before things become particularly serious or uh, concerning in some way. We know that often families don't know who to call when their student is concerned about something or has this conflict. And so we want people to know that they can refer students to our office. KU Student Housing uh, are really great partners with us in this work. And so they're also doing a lot of that conflict coaching and conflict dialogue with students as well, but happy to really learn from the student what makes the most sense for them, what's comfortable for them, and then how can we start to give them those tools. I will say that if a student is experiencing a conflict where they are being physically harmed, whether that's sexual misconduct or hazing or something else where they are being harmed, we would never expect that person to resolve that situation on their own, or uh, engage in that without support. And so if that's the case, 
We have lots of resources and opportunities to support them, but would encourage them to come right to us when that happens. So I do want you to talk about um, the three reasons or violations that students may um, encounter um, one of you or one of your staff members being um, violations of the code, violations of university policy, um, or violations of housing policy. But before you do that, will you talk about um, some of the educational outreach you do um, and include in that, I like to say, um, some of your invitations to a conversation? Sure, <laughs> absolutely. Um, so my team uh, is highly focused on leading with education, not leading with any kind of um, punishment or policy violation. And so even when we are talking about policy violations, we're doing that through an educational space. Uh, I have a full-time staff member and then one uh, graduate intern right now who are focused entirely on prevention education work. And so in the context of our work, we're talking about that through hazing prevention uh, and then partnering with other uh, great KU colleagues on things like sexual assault prevention, alcohol and drug prevention, and then a variety of support for our student organizations, sororities and fraternities, athletics teams, uh, and other groups. And so a uh, significant amount of work happening around all of the ways that we can do less of what's harmful to the community and more of what's helpful and makes us a, a great Jayhawk community to be a part of. We are also offering to student organizations and then certainly to individual students education around conflict resolution and how they can engage in creating a stronger team, sorority, fraternity, student organization, whatever it may be from the front end, rather than waiting until some sort of conflict or problem happens to, uh, to tackle that. So certainly there's a lot happening uh, on the front end, prevention wise. But then as you said, there are times when we invite people to engage in an educational conversation. Uh, often that comes into play when uh, perhaps what they've done is problematic and uh, concerning to the community, but it's not necessarily a university policy violation or a violation of the code or housing policy. Uh, often this comes into play uh, related to speech concerns and free speech. Certainly uh, as a public institution, as part of our student rights and that code of student rights and responsibilities, we protect free speech and protect uh, students' ability to engage in dialogue on whatever topic they find meaningful. And we know that that speech can sometimes be harmful to other people. And so there are times when we might engage in a conversation around, uh, again, not stopping their speech, but helping them understand the impact that their words may be having on others. There may be um, particular things that students are doing that again, are not a policy violation, but are just concerning to the other individuals involved. And so we have a, a series of um, workshops and tools that we can use to help them think through the impact of their decisions and their behaviors uh, in a way that is hopefully recognizing whatever they are dealing with, but also helping them to recognize how other people might experience that as well. Thank you. So do you want to dive into what, what, wow. happens, what happens if a student violates the code policy, yes. either in housing or a larger university policy? Absolutely. So the primary things that we see, um, primary violations, are either violations of that housing policy or the code of student rights and responsibilities, which covers quite a bit. Occasionally, there are other university policy violations that we are working with students on. But if our office receives information that a potential policy violation has occurred, we are going to send the student a notice, let them know what we know at that point. Our process is highly transparent, and we're never trying to hide information from students. But we're sending the student a letter, letting them know what information we've received, when we received it, how we received it, as much information as we can, 
and then inviting the student to come in for a conversation. That conduct violation notice will include the charges that the student potentially violated. So, or the policies that the student potentially violated. So if a student is uh, intoxicated in one of the residence halls, for example, that conduct violation notice is going to give the student information about the incident as we learned about it, and then the university policies related to alcohol, and then if it occurred in housing, also that housing alcohol policy violation. So whatever the appropriate policies are, and then we invite the student to come in for a conversation and engage with one of my staff members on what happened and share their perspective. That letter that the students get is going to include information about their rights through the conduct process. And then that meeting that we have with the student will start with a conversation about their rights so that the students understand the process from the front end, want them to feel as comfortable as possible. The number one question we get when students come in uh, is, or call us when they get that letter, is am I going to get suspended for, for this situation? And we always tell students that that is not on the table unless we've already told them that suspension was a possibility. So if suspension is a possibility, and that's a very rare occurrence, it does happen, but it's a very rare occurrence, we're going to tell them from the front end that suspension is possible. They're going to get a different kind of letter, uh, different information and steps to proceed. The vast majority of those conduct hearings that we have are educational in nature. They are informal. They are time spent getting to know the student, learning more about what's happening in their life that led to this, and then how we can have that educational experience moving forward. So. Uh, students can be really nervous about that. They can be pretty uh, anxious about what that process looks like. And we do our best to reassure students that their perspective on that hearing is just as important as any other perspective that we've received prior to the hearing. And I always tell students that, that we know every report that comes to my desk, whether that comes from housing or a member of the university community, the KU police, however that incident came to my office, that report is written from a human perspective and that person has their own lens and view on what happened in the situation. And the student who's coming in also has their own lens and view on what happened. And so we really prioritize making space for the student to share with us from their perspective and not just sort of responding to the charges that are against them. And so who should a student have join in the process? So that is entirely up to the student. So many of our students come to their hearing alone. Again, it's an informal conversation. And so it's in some ways much like a conversation that they would have with any other staff member on campus. It's not meant to be a scary process at all. Uh, and so many students do choose to attend alone, and that's a perfectly reasonable option. Students can bring up to three people with them, and often students do bring a parent or a family member, uh, perhaps a friend who can be a good support system to them. Sometimes our students bring another university staff member that they have built a relationship with and feel is a trusted mentor or support person for them. And then students can bring a lawyer if they choose to engage in that process. So if uh, you are an out-of-state parent, there is certainly no need to fly from a different state for that informal hearing. There are ways that you can be looped into that if your student wants that. Uh, there is no obligation or expectation that students do bring a lawyer. It's not at all necessary. But I know that some students do choose to engage with that process and and that's certainly uh, an option for them. If that's something that a family member is considering, uh, we would be happy to talk with them more about the process before they engage with that lawyer. If that's of interest to them, um, certainly can't make that decision for them, but give them in more information about the process and potential outcomes of that case before they go down that route. So students uh, have the ability to bring, again, up to three people, and that can be any three people, but certainly okay for them to come alone as well. 
That is a lot of great information, Katie. Um, maybe, so you can look at this either way, either what is your most commonly asked question or what is, or maybe you can answer both, the most important thing that you want parents and families to know after watching this um, student affair shares. Absolutely. So, you know, I think our most commonly asked question is that, am I going to get suspended question? And people often feel like it is the end of the world when they get that conduct uh, violation notice. And I, I want to reassure people that it is very, very rarely the end of the world, uh, that those conversations are meant to truly help a student look at what's going well about KU, but clearly something happened that was not going well. And that may be a particular incident, that may be a longer term pattern of behavior, but something didn't go according to plan. In my experience, I've yet to interact with a student who wanted to violate policies and wanted to find themselves in a, a difficult situation. People get wrapped up with friend groups and uh, other things. And, and so what we want is to help students navigate through that and look at what are their KU goals and how can we help with that. So I would encourage students coming in, parents, if they are working with students who are a part of this process, to really be open with us about uh, what happened and potentially what led to that. Sometimes we have students come in who tell us uh, things aren't going particularly well and they're having a hard time connecting with their academic advisor, for example. Uh, we can do some things to facilitate some of those conversations in a way that um, perhaps is difficult for the student to pick up the phone and make that phone call, but we can provide that support. So. We actually know that students who come through our process are more likely to graduate than students who don't. There are a lot of reasons for that, but part of that is that we're able to help redirect and help get people connected to resources or support or different involvement opportunities that they uh, may be interested in, but haven't had the, the ability or the courage or the time to take that step. And so through our process, we can help with some of those pieces. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. Today, Katie, to talk about the great work that is being done in student conduct and community standards. Um, do you want to quickly give contact information should parents want to reach out? Absolutely. So easiest way to find our information is on our website, studentconduct.ku.edu. Uh, at the bottom of that form, um, you'll certainly find staff information, but at the bottom of our website, you also see our reporting forms, and that's a great way to get information to us, either if your student is experiencing a conflict in some way, or uh, if your student is experiencing hazing in any way, both of those reporting forms are on our website. We can also then help make connections to uh, other groups on campus that provide support, like our student care referral team and mental health services. Great. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, you have a lot going on. I look forward to more great things coming from your team. Thank you. All righty. Bye-bye and rock chalk. Bye.